All right, party people, we are back uh, with the never-ending story of protostomes. Mainly because protostomes encompass a large number of animal phyla. So this will potentially be the last lecture about protostomes. I have no idea how long this is going to take. So we're just going to do the next 50 minutes, see what happens. All right, so where we ended was uh, we were starting to, starting to finish up nematodes. And we were talking about the various diseases, uh, the various infections of uh, nematodes in humans that cause all sorts of problems. And the, this last part of it, I'm kind of just going to zip through because I don't really care if you know sp specifically what parts of plants that nematodes infect. I just want you to know that not only are humans uh, infected sometimes with parasitic nematodes, but also other organisms. So we're just going to move through this briefly. And I, this whole point, the whole point of this slide was that a lot of those issues with nematodes, in, especially in tropical regions, um, are really related to a lack of good sanitation and modern plumbing. Um, really related to you know, there's a lot of poverty in these areas. So that's directly related to that. So let's move on to the other organisms that nematodes parasitize. So insects, we've actually used nematodes as, um, an, it is essentially as an insecticide in the past. That has been one way that we have used in, uh, nematodes. So one organism that nematodes parasitizes the Japanese beetle. Right, um, and basically they move through various organisms to parasitize these beetles, okay, and as well as other animals. So they're insect parasites by way of various organisms. Plant parasites they infect various parts of the plant. The most common that you hear about typically are roots. Um, but they can infect other parts of the plant. As you can see here, various kinds of uh, parasitizing masses in plants. You don't have to know the specifics. I just want you to know that they are insect parasites as well as plant parasites. My dog is running through the room. All right. You don't have to know the specific types. I just want you to know they can be plant parasites. And you can often see how the plants are affected even from aerial views. You can see this field here has been infected with nematode parasites on those plants. Right? Uh, it's, and it's hard to see in this picture, but back there, you, those plants also have been infected with nematodes and are not doing well. Right? And this is actually a pretty big problem for agriculture. Um, I think I alluded to the fact that I had a, I have a cousin and I know several folks who they work with uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and specifically on nematode research and how to prevent and mitigate problems with parasitic nematodes with respect to crop yields. Because these is particularly the plants tend to, uh, the, the nematodes, excuse me, tend to attack the roots, which you know are so important for plant success. But here you can see these actually this isn't a root these are tubers but these tubers um yeah that's right these tubers have been infected with nematodes so the whole point of this last part um about nematodes is just to know they can be human parasites but also insect parasites and plant parasites okay so with that we're going to move on to my favorite protostomes. Should I turn on a light? Maybe so. It's getting dark. Ah! Oh, now I'm bright. Oh, well, we'll deal with it. Okay. So, the last organisms that we're going to talk about in the protostomes are the arthropods. Arthropods. My favorite phylum. Okay, these are without a doubt the most successful animals on earth and they affect that's over. They affect all aspects of human life and non-human life. 
we have all sorts of relationships with insects, as do pretty much every other animal that I can think of, and plants, and fungi, I mean, you, bacteria, you just, just name it, okay? Insects, not just insects, arthropods are a, an integral as, aspect of pretty much every, most organisms on Earth's life, okay? Partially because they're just so diverse and widespread. You find arthropods literally everywhere, marine habitats, freshwater habitats, terrestrial habitats, and they have a pretty wide range of sizes from, this is 80 micrometers. I mean, you can find ticks and mites that are in the nanometer range, I'll say, up to whole meters long, pretty big. And just as we did in lab, we're gonna focus on four extant subphyla, extant meaning that they are still alive and with us. So those four subphyla within phylum arthropoda who are part of the ectozoa, these are animals that undergo ectosis or molt. Those four subphyla are myriapoda, which are the centipedes and millipedes, the hexapoda, which include the insects and the non-insect hectopods, such as bristletails and springtails, crustaceans, and chelicerata are the chelicerates, uh, of course, crustaceans, sorry, let me back up, include lobsters, crabs, shrimp, stuff my son likes to eat, roly-polies, isopods are actually crustaceans, um, and then again, chlycerates, which include mites, ticks, scorpions, spiders, stuff that people don't normally like, I guess is the best way to say. So those are the four extant subphyla of arthropods. There also is one extinct subphylum of arthropods, and that is uh, the trilobites. So trilobitomorpha. Trilobitomorpha, here you can see them. This is a trilobite, all right? These, again, are extinct, but they are ancient arthropods. And similar to the crustaceans, but unlike other arthropods, they have biromus appendages, which means they had basically forked appendages, right? Forked is biromus. So, but again, trilobites are extinct. So let's go through each one of the subphyla briefly. Again, we did this in lab. So this is kind of a review, which is kind of nice, right? Okay, so Calicerata, we're gonna move through these and then we're gonna talk about their physiology and all that kind of stuff. So again, Calicerata, spiders, right? Those are the, well, these are arachnids, right? So Calicerata, the spiders, the ticks, and the scorpions and the horseshoe crabs. And the hallmark, could you not run in here while I'm teaching a class? Cool, could you do that outside? So, you can tell how our quarantine is going. So, the hallmark of the Colocerata is that these organisms have, their, their front appendages are modified into chelicerae. So they have chelicerae and pedipulps. And the chelicerae are up here, burp, 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 right close to the mouth, right? And these are modified into either fangs, especially in spiders, they're fangs, or pincers. All right, crustacea. Who are the crustacea? Well, you got a lobster. That looks like a really great rap album. A lot of these do. Man, they look super like, mm, yeah, down, eat the rich. I don't know, like Killer Mike or something. Anyway, if you haven't listened to Killer Mike, you should. Uh, anyway, planting seeds, lobsters, crades, isopods. As I mentioned, isopods are roly polies. If you ever played with roly polies when you were small, those are crustaceans. Barnacles, not this, it's a bivalve, but these are barnacles. And scorpions, shrimps, excuse me, shrimps, shrimps. Okay. Sorry, y'all. I say things in weird ways sometimes. So, myriapods. Those are the centipedes and millipedes. They have mandibles for mouth parts and paired unirimous appendages. That means that they are not forked. I'm about to, excuse me, let me close this door. Sorry. So, the myriapods. Hexapods, these are insects and non-insect hexapods. So 
Those non-insect hectopods, there are, I think, three classes of non-insect hectopods. Hect See what I'm doing? Hexapods. Y'all, I promise I'm just tired. I have not been, like, I haven't had a, a cocktail or anything. I'm just really tired. Um, so, insects and spring tails. I know y'all understand. Y'all know me. So, that includes the beetles. <laughs> the beetles, right? The flies. Bees, butterflies, grasshoppers, true bugs, and flies. That's a flea. Mm. That's okay. Or, as I like to call them, coleopterans, dipterans, uh, springtails are escaping me right now, lepidopterans, hymenopterans, hemipterans, orthopterans, and that's not really a dipteran, but it is, it is, we'll just go with it for now. Okay. Hallmarks of hexapods. Again, these guys also have uniramous appendages, which means they are not, um, they're not forked. And their mouth parts, rather than having chelicerae, like the chelicerates, they have mandibles. And that's true of the other arthropods that are not chelicerates, okay? And they clearly, they have three um, segments, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Head, thorax, and abdomen. And within the arthropods, most arthropods, this is the myriapods, um, arachnids, crustaceans, let's see, crustaceans, oh, sorry, those are other insects, crustaceans, arachnids, myriapods, and other arthropods. That is misspelled. Anyway, most of them are insects. 85% of arthropods are insects, and arthropods are the most successful phylum on Earth. And you notice that a good third of that is, is the beetles. And um, you, to help you remember that, I guess, I think I've mentioned before, um, Javius Haldane is, he is a very famous um, physiologist and biostatistician, and it's credited to him that when somebody asked him about the creator, which you learned about all your studies, how, what does that reveal to you about the creator? He said he has an inordinate fondness for beetles because most of the very successful phylum are the coleopterans or the beetles. You don't have to know that they're coleopterans, but that's their that's their order name. They're beetles. All right, so why are arthropods so successful? Again, we're reviewing from lab, which is what I love about this part of the semester, and it's kind of nice that this part of the semester took place during a pandemic because we're basically just doing all the same stuff now. <laughs> so big ways that these guys are successful. First, they're segmented bodies. That's where arthropoda comes from. That is a type of Arthropoda, so jo let's see, jointed arthro appendages or feet poda, right? So that's down here. They have those jointed appendages, and then they also have a chitinous exoskeleton. Other proteins are also part of that exoskeleton, but a chitinous exoskeleton, hard exoskeleton. So that segmentation, those jointed appendages, and that exoskeleton had a huge part in making these organisms successful, and essentially ubiquitous throughout the world, all right? So let's talk a little bit about their segmentation. These are the key features of arthropods. So this segmentation we also can call tagmatization because the, the actual segments themselves we call tagmata. Each one is a tagma, and that is essentially a functional unit of the animal. So, for example, in a hexapod, that is, those tagmata are the head, thorax, and abdomen. It's different for, for example, the, um, the uh, meristomata, those, and the chelicerates, well, and the arachnids and the chelicerates, right? They have a cephalothorax, or a prosoma, and an abdomen, okay? So here we have it here. So that cephalothorax, we learned in lab, so we're just kind of slowly introducing these terms, even though I, it was on the, on the slides in the lab. I was like, don't worry about this right now. We'll talk about it later. So that cephalothorax, that particularly in some of the uh, subphyla, you have the head and the thorax are fused. That's a cephalothorax, all right? And then you have the abdomen and the chelicerates. That um, has its own name, right? Let me see if I can show you really, go ahead and show you. Now, we'll, we'll get to that though. Um, let's see a pistosoma. So, 
That exoskeleton, very important. It provides protection for the animal from, you know, any kind of environmental or biological factor that might come um, and potentially harm the animal. Oh, now you hear my dog eating a bone. Okay. Also provides protection against water loss in the animal. And um, the, there are positives, there are pros and cons to having an, that exoskeleton, that hard outer chitinous exoskeleton. And just here I'm saying it's made of chitin and other proteins. Okay. But the problem is that, you know, when you are a terrestrial animal, then you it basically it can weigh you down a little bit. And so you have this trade-off between thickness, which is a protective thing and protects against water loss, and actually being able to um, move around more easily. Additionally, you have vulnerability between um, episodes of ectasis, particularly right after ectasis. So when an organism first molts, right? So as an arthropod grows, it will start to outgrow during certain parts of development. It will outgrow its exoskeleton. So it has to molt. And, and that process, again, is called ectasis. That's why they're called ectasozoans because they molt. And that, when the organism first molts, it's soft again. That exoskeleton has to harden over time. So they're vulnerable to any abiotic or biotic factors that they may come into contact with. Um, to tell, you can actually tell whether an arthropod has recently molted by the color. So if you find a, like a crayfish or an isopod, like a roly-poly um, or even a tick. Recently, I found a, a tick that had recently molted and I was like, what? And so these animals will typically be light colored almost white when they're freshly molted and they're much softer if you poked it they're much softer than normal um so like i said i i recently found a tick that was crawling on me that was obviously it was small and recently molted it was white and i was like what i don't normally see ticks that have recently molted that's pretty cool so just know though that is actually a it's important because that's how they grow but it leaves them vulnerable okay so that is somewhat of a con there all right, so those jointed appendages, pretty much all of their appendages, their antennae, their mouth parts, and their legs are jointed. Okay, and again, the name for this phylum, arthrojointed poda feet or appendages. So huge, huge innovation because they can extend their appendages and retract them. And so they have lots of freedom of movement and it provides them a stable point for movement, okay? So let's talk a little bit about arthropod physiology, because I know you're just, that's all you think about all day, right? Actually, I kind of do. Anyway, so let's talk first about the circulatory system. So the circulatory system of an arthropod is open, okay? They do have blood vessels, but they, the actual, circulatory system itself is open. And so blood will move through the vessels and then out to bathe the or organs into the hemocele. So here, this is just an example here of an arthropod circulatory system, particularly in a coelohymenopteran, okay? All right, so here, this is a this is a dorsal blood vessel. You often will have um, the, a ventral and a dorsal blood vessel here, but, but on that dorsal blood vessel, you have, um, muscular tissue that pump that blood, okay? Um, and we refer to these as hearts. They're not hearts like your heart, but they do pump that blood. And as we saw in lab, they have ostia for blood to move into the heart, those holes. Um, so that's what those holes are. They're called ostia. Talk about the nervous system. Pretty simple, pretty small. Sorry, arthropods, I'm not Peyton. It just is small. What do you want? So just to compare with, for example, there's a planaria, there's a flatworm, phylum platyhelminthes, not an arthropod, right? But to compare here, we have a crustacean, right? A crayfish and a dipteran who is an insect. So you see the brain here. So since we've had cephalization, right? Way back, we've learned about 
some of those more primitive phyla with cephalization, you had concentration of nerve tissue toward the anterior end of the animal. So that was really helpful and that was a big key innovation as animals evolved. So here you have these small brains in the anterior portion of the animal, particularly in the hexapods and animals that have a head, thorax, and abdomen. Of course, the brain is in the head. This isn't going to be hard to remember. And in the crustaceans and the chelicerates, the brain is in the cephalothorax. Okay, so let's briefly go through the parts of here you see a grasshopper. So you probably remember this because we did this in lab. So let's 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 review. You can actually come back to this part of the video to help you review if you want. So there's a brain, guys. Just, just go with me. Okay. With that dorsal blood vessel in the heart. Okay. And you saw the ostia in the grasshopper this week, last week, last week in lab. Okay, now let's come down here. Let's go first through the digestive system. Here is our mouth that leads into a pharynx, but just know this is the mouth. Okay, here, what is that? That's the crop. Then we move down, we have these little gastric cica. All right, important for digestion. And here we have the stomach, yay! All right, that's the stomach. And as we move down, now once you're going farther down, you have these little stringy things that are really hard to see that are the malpighian tubules. Yeah, malpighian tubules. Very important for waste concentration and excretion. You can almost think of them as like super primitive kidneys. And then we come down, we've got the intestine here. Right, this is the intestine. And this is, I mean, this is technically the rectum. The rectum is the area of intestine right before you get to the anus. So that would be the rectum. Um, and so that would be the digestive system. Here, we didn't see, I don't think we really saw in our grasshopper, but just above that dorsally that digestive system you would find the gonad and this is this would be a female it would be the ovary okay so that would be the ovary so she would have an ovipositor here on her tail and one hallmark of these animals the arthropods you have these ventral ganglia that run along the animal okay and i think that yeah that's everything that i really really want you to be sure to know with your arthropods okay a little bit more about the physiology of arthropods. Remember in lab last week, we talked about ocelli. They're those simple eyes, and they're found between. I was like, I did this. They really not like this, but I mean, I was thinking of my headgear. So, oh, I should have worn my headgear again. Uh, okay, well, if this takes multiple, if this takes multiple tries, we'll go for it. So, these ocelli, here's the compound eyes of the organism, which I'll touch on in just a second. But in between, that's where you have the ocelli, which are the simple eyes. And the simple eyes detect light, okay? Light and dark. They help the organism detect light and dark. All right, so those compound eyes are the eyes you think of when you see, usually an insect, right? But an arthropod. So those compound eyes are... Man, have you ever looked through like one of those little things that's like, this is making me look like you see like an insect? It it be like that. Okay, it be like that. So they have like a ton of these visual units that are independent. And the, each independent unit, and I'm about to show you the physiology of each one because it's crazy. They're their own, they're their own units. Those units are called omatidia. The singular is omatidium. So each of these eyes is a bunch. Each one of those little dots is an omatidium, which is in and of itself an independent, essentially, eye. Okay? They can see not only farther around than humans. I mean, they see more of the visual spectrum than we do. They can actually visualize, and that's what I'm saying here, UV light. Okay? We don't visualize UV light on the electromagnetic spectrum. 
he can't see anything really past, you know, purple, which is a shorter wavelength. UV is an even, sh even shorter wavelength. Insects can see it, but humans cannot. Okay, so if you look at one of these compound eyes, each one of these is an omatidium, right? And they all feed into the optic nerve. So if you were to actually look at the anatomy of each one of these, each one has a cornea, okay? Each one has its own cone. And this rhabdom right here is basically a light sensitive central core. And basically the main thing you need to know is those compound eyes have their own visual units, like hundreds to thousands of them. And most amazingly, here are the mantis shrimp. This stuff is bananas. So the mantis shrimp is an arthropod, it's a crustacean. They have 16 photoreceptors. And I know you're sitting there like, well, I have like 25. No, you don't. Don't lie. You know how many photoreceptors? Well, how, I don't know. Not, let me be specific. Do you know how many kinds of photoreceptors? That's what we're saying with this. Do you know how many kinds of photoreceptors you have? Some of you are like, I know some of you are like staring at the screen going, yeah, no, it does this. Good, but it's two. You have rods and you have cones. And that's all you got, baby. I'm sorry to tell you. But the mantis shrimp has 16 kinds. The mantis shrimp can see colors that we can't even see, man. Actually, I think there's an, a really fun oatmeal. Um, if you've ever seen The Oatmeal, which is a, it's a comic, and he talks about the mantis shrimp. I'll post that in our updates because it's pretty fun. Isn't that amazing, though? So arthropods have, like, this beautiful, this amazing ability Essentially, arthropods can see more of the world than you can. Makes you feel a little less evolved, huh? I know. You're like, wow, arthropods can see more than me. I want to see more. I want to be a mantis shrimp. Okay. Oh my gosh, is my dog seriously going to do this right now? Really? show you. Why not? Okay. Just a second. And we're back. So now let's talk about respiratory systems. Okay. So in the aquatic arthropods, you have true gills, as you see here with the, the crayfish, and we saw this last week, right? Because you actually saw the crayfish's gills. They're very feathery. And in these crustaceans, they're essentially joined to the legs through the, the, the carapace, excuse me. And so as they move their legs, the gills are moved underneath the carapace through water so that they have um, efficient gas exchange, which is pretty interesting. I think that's a pretty ingenious design. And so you have your gills in aquatic arthropods, except in the chelicerates. And in the chelicerates, you have, these are, yeah, there it is, book gills. So on the ventral side of a horseshoe crab, which is class Meristomata, they have book gills for gas exchange. Okay. And these are thought to be some sort of modified tissue that have been legs at one point. These are particularly for respiration in the horseshoe crabs. So gills and book gills, okay? But seeing that arthropods are very small, their respiratory system doesn't have a lot of internal structure. So for those terrestrial arthropods, you have spiracles and the tracheae and tracheoles. So here, again, the grasshopper. Remember that you have your spir spiracle, which is the opening to the outside along the animal, and those abdominal segments each have one spiracle. And those spiracles are openings here. They can open and close them, okay? And that is connected to the trachea. So they have multiple trachea. And a trachea is 
is a, basically a small branched cuticle lined duct. Okay, and those branches branch into tracheals. And those tracheals are in direct contact with cells. So you can have very efficient direct gas exchange of oxygen into the animal and CO2 out of the animal. So the way that, that gas moves in and out of a terrestrial arthropod would be through the spiracles to, a to an individual trachea or the trachea as in a in plural, right? Into tracheals directly into the body cells. Okay, great. And here you can see where this, this is a, an electron micrograph of a spherical closed here and open. So they're actually able to do this as a way to conserve water, to conserve water in the animal because if they were open all the time, then they would theoretically dehydrate much more easily. Okay, one special kind of respiratory organ we find specifically in uh, spiders. So class arachnida, you don't have to know these are, what order these are. Um, no, I'm not gonna say it. I don't need to tell you anymore. So book lungs are these special, basically special air sacs um, and for gas exchange and they're air is brought in and out through muscular contraction. Okay, so in terrestrial spiders, you have book lungs here. Okay. All right, let's talk about the excretory system. In aquatic arthropods, most of that waste just diffuses straight out of the gills into the environment because you're in a, some sort of aquatic medium. It's just expelled through the gills. However, if you are, um, now, with that being said, you do have malpighian tubules um, across insects, including aquatic insects. But those malpighian tubules are particularly for excretion of nitrogenous wastes. So here you have a diagram of an, a arthropod digestive system. Hemocele out here, that's where like, the blood stuff is, that is bathing the organs, not the blood stuff, the hemolymph, the blood is bathing the organs. All right, here's the mid gut. So you have a foregut, a mid gut, and a hind gut. I'll show you that in a little bit. But here in the mid gut, you have food passing through, okay? So this would be the stomach. And here you have the malpighian tubules. So what happens in the malpighian tubules is that nitrogenous wastes are precipitated and they're precipitated to become uric acid. And that uric acid is then emptied into the hind gut. Well, uric acid and guanine. And that is emptied into the hind gut and, and eventually eliminated, all right? So that is the function of the malpighian tubules. Pretty simple, pretty quick. I think your book only gives a quick blurb about this. And so just be sure that you know what the function of the malpighian tubules, okay? Removal of nitrogenous waste by way of concentrating those wastes. Okay, so what do arthropods eat? I was asking you. Okay, let's say, yeah, I don't know. I'm, oh my gosh, everybody else, they eat other arthropods. They eat, apparently, annelids. They eat other animals. They can be carnivorous. They can eat fruit. Be, they are herbivorous, fungi, oh my gosh, I guess you just, bat bacteria, yes, okay. So arthropods pretty much eat, they occupy a range of, of feeding niches. So you have carnivorous arthropods, predatory arthropods, you have herbivorous uh, arthropods that eat primary producers, plants, you have detritivorous arthropods who eat decaying organic matter, okay? So you have all sorts of arthropod feeding modalities. So you name it, they eat it, okay? And again, as I said before, the, the arthropod digestive system is really divided into this foregut that consists of the mouth and the crop and 
many of them have a gizzard. You didn't really see this in the, you couldn't really see it in um, the, the Dorthopterans. They don't have like a very pronounced gizzard. But many uh, organisms in this so in this phylum do have gizzards. So crop, here you have gastric cica, and then you reach the gastric cica at the beginning of the midgut that go into the stomach. Okay, and then as you move through the stomach, all right, past non pigian tubules, you reach the intestine, and that is behind gut. All right. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about you know. Okay, so most arthropods practice internal reproduction. There are some exceptions, um, but mostly internal. And oftentimes you will have the use of a spermatophore. What a spermatophore is, these are showing you spermatophores. A spermatophore is a protein capsule that contains a mass of sperm. So it's essentially a way to keep a bunch, a big glob of sperm safe and nourished, okay? And these spermatophores are transferred during mating, particularly with various insects um, and some other arthropods, and also actually some mollusks do this. We talk a lot about spermatophore transfer in animal behavior, so if you really want to hear a lot more about that and use of spermatophores as um, some sometimes maternal nutrition and sometimes as a nuptial gift, then hit me up in animal behavior sometime. Okay, so spermatophores key in their critical portions of some arthropod reproductive modes. Okay, and again, that's a basically just a mass of sperm within a protein capsule, okay, to keep those sperms safe. Most, almost all arthropods, the spermatophore is important in allowing those sperm to reach the female and fertilize, and most insects and I should just say insects arthropods y'all know I love insects legs you probably know that right but there are there are there is an arthropod yes that gives live birth prepare to be horrified can you guess it's not spiders if you haven't seen spider eggs are you from Arkansas um so scorpions Scorpions give live birth. Now, they do still have eggs, like that they're fertilized internally. Uh, and those eggs hatch inside the mother, and the mother then gives live birth. Ooh, right? I can just imagine a little scorpion midwife delivering baby. Anyway, all right. So that is how arthropods reproduce. Now, we've already gone through this. So I'm not going to go all the way through it again. If you want to stop here and take a nice gander at these, the digestive and reproductive system, you can. Just remember, you saw it with the grasshopper. Feel free to look back at your dissection. And then you have your gonad up here between the heart and the digestive system. We didn't really get a good look at that, really, in the dissection. So obviously, I'm not going to be like, is this a grasshopper ovary? But you should just know that the gonad would be here. Okay. All right. External anatomy of particularly a um, hexapod here, but an arthropod. Remember from lab, you saw all of these, right? The head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And each abdominal segment there has spiracles. But here above the femur, you have the tympanum. Now the tympanum is very important as an auditory organ. It allows the animal to sense sound, right, in its environment. A few other things that you'll see in some arthropods, just for funsies, especially in the flying arthropods, you'll have some accessory air sacs that assist with gas exchange during flight and also, um, well, particularly the gas exchange during flight because it's an energy intensive process. And some arthropods have basically a, a defense mechanism. So particularly in the hymenoptera, but obviously, you know, Cholicerates, right? Scorpions. Um, you have the stinger with a po poison sac associated with it, so that in some arthropods that is used for stunning and essentially subduing prey or subduing a competitor in 
the hymenoptera, such as bees and wasps, particularly with that poison sac in the in the bees, a lot of it has it's primarily a defense mechanism. So um, bees will compete with other bees, but they won't sting each other. They actually they do like a weird little it's almost like a dance battle. And then they well they don't dance. It's like a man, how do I explain this to you without taking too long? Because it's really cool. So the way that bees compete for territory, basically they have rumbles. I'm not joking. They have rumbles. And they meet, I'm not joking, at dawn. I'm not kidding. This is exactly how it happens. You could look it up. Bee battles. Look them up. They meet at dawn at like a place where they're both, you know, trying to establish hives. And you've got like the, the one faction and the other faction. And they'll, basically they'll fly up. They'll pair off and do this. And then they'll kind of tumble down to the ground together, it's kind of not really wrestling because they're not really trying to touch each other. They're just kind of, ooh, ooh. and but there is some pretty hefty mortality associated with that. And after a few hours, they'll just leave and they'll come back over and over again until one faction gives up, not even a joke. But that stinger and that poison sack is really for defensive the hive. So if you come upon a beehive, they're not really going to bother you unless you bother the hive, because that's what it's for. Because obviously, the bee, well, maybe not obviously, maybe not everyone knows this, but bees, most bees have barbed stingers. So if they sting you, they're, this is actually tied to the rest of the abdominal um, viscera, and you will eviscerate the animal. Its guts will come out. So, yeah, that's fun. It's casual. So, yeah, so let's talk about each one in depth a little bit, just for a few minutes, and then uh, and then I'll let you go for now. So let's talk about the chalicerates. Chalicerates, you know them. You may not love them. Um, this is an eight. Don't, don't. So this is just showing you how they're different. Your spider and your ant. Okay, so these are spiders, ticks, mites, scorpions, daddy long legs, which are not spiders, BT dubs. And they can't bite you, and the bite won't hurt you. There's no way for them to... It just... Who told you that? Horseshoe crabs and sea spiders. And some of you were like, sea spiders? Oh my god, sea spiders? Yeah. Make peace with them. Okay. So, of course, the hallmark of this subphylum is the chalicera. That's how you remember it. They're the chalicerata. Okay? And so these are fangs. Right here. Look at those little fangs. In the other arthropods here, it, just to show you for comparison as an ant, a formicid. So you see here, these are mandibles. But these are chalicerae, which are essentially fangs. And particularly in the spiders. My dog, is, my dog smells a squirrel. Yep, okay. In the spot. In the spiders, you know what, we'll just move on. <laughs> These fangs have poison associated with them. All right, so in the chalicerates, the body is divided into two tagmata. Remember that as specialized segments, all right? In lab, we introduced this with some simple, simple nomenclature. Um, so again, the cephalothorax, we also call the prosoma. And here the abdomen is the epistosoma. Okay. All right. So in the prosoma, the cephalothorax, you have your chalicera here. This modified usually into some sort of finger pincer like structure. The pedipalps, which have a couple of, right there, the pedipalps, which have a couple of functions we'll talk about in just a minute, three in particular. Four walking, four. Walking legs per side, so a total of eight, all right? And then that abdomen or epistosoma. So what do pedipalps do? We mentioned this in lab, so really this is just review. So they're, they can be used for pincers. These are the pedipalps in a scorpion. Lovely, okay? A lot of these chalicerates will use them as a way to sense the environment, and of course, they are important in copulation, particularly for arachnids and male, male spiders, the um, arianids, um, spiders, 
We'll use them to grasp the female. Before they get eaten. That's another, that's a day, that's another day. But we'll talk about that. So lots of species of chalicerates, many of which are spiders and scorpions, mostly, probably mostly spiders. Not probably, I know that. So 70,000 species of chalicerates with 4,000 species of mites and one species, that's not right. Nope, that's not right at all. Let's fix that right now, shall we? So while we're here, thank you. So that should be, I was like, we're going to look it up right now. Mm -mm. 40,000 species of spider. Again, most of these guys are spiders. You do have some freshwater chalicerates, though most chalicerates are, for example, the horseshoe crab is marine. Sea spiders are marine. You do have some marine mites. Uh, those are chalicerates in order acari, that's the ticks and mites. You don't have to know that order, I'm just telling you that for your own funsies, for your edification. You obviously have freshwater mites, there are some, a um, few freshwater chalicerates, but for the most part, chalicerates are terrestrial, so obviously spiders and ticks and mites and scorpions. So what do chalicerates eat? For the most part, chalicerates are carnivorous. Um, Spiders are really important ecosystems as predators, but, and of course, you have ticks who are parasit parasitizing on all sorts of animals. Mites, though, however, can be herbivorous. So, um, a fun little factoid, daddy long legs, they can't really ingest Well, okay, so daddy long legs, that's not true. So a lot of daddy long, long legs have really small mouths and they can only ingest liquid food. They'll actually like secrete digestive enzymes and then suck it out with their pharynx. All right, so how do they eat? Again, injecting those enzymes, and sucking it up with the muscular pharynx, particularly with the daddy long legs. The others can actually use those illicary to grab food and put it into their mouth, okay? So here you have the, uh, oh, look at these guys. So here you have, oh, see, here's a female and a male horseshoe crab. So the horseshoe crabs, you don't have to know the order or the family, but Lemulidae is basically only a few species. And one of the most prominent species of horseshoe crabs is Lemulus. And again, I talked, we talked a little bit about the importance of horseshoe crabs to human medical, um, medical tests and particularly to test for contamination in the food supply. They're very important for that as well, their blood. Um, but you don't have to know that for, for, for lecture, just so you know. It's just a fun factoid about horseshoe crabs. So these, again, are marine organisms primarily found uh, in the Atlantic and in Southeast Asia. So if you've ever been to the ocean, you may have seen a horseshoe crab. In fact, I would love for you to tell me if you've seen a horseshoe crab. And the thing is, horseshoe crabs aren't crabs. They're not crabs, right? Horseshoe crabs are more like spiders. They're more closely related to spiders. Here you see the ventral side of the animal, right, with the book gills and the walking legs. You can't really see the chalicerae, but they're there, and their pedipalps are there too. And here you have the telson, which again is not a stinger. It's just a little tail. That's the telson. Let me make sure that you know how to spell that, telson. Okay. All right. We're getting close to our, our time. So maybe we'll talk about startup with spiders next time. Um, you know what? I bet we could finish. No, don't do it, Alan. Hmm. Yeah, we're gonna have to do it next time. I don't wanna keep you too long in this video. So we're gonna continue with spiders next time and we'll finish up. We're gonna finish up protostomes next time. And so on Wednesday, for Wednesday's lecture, so theoretically, you're watching this on April 20th, if not before, on Monday. So the next lecture, 
who will finish protostomes and get started on deuterostomes. And I'm hoping to actually finish our lectures a little early. I would love to finish lectures um, by Friday, but it may or may not happen that way. Either way, I'm going to try to get these lectures up just so you can watch them in advance if you want to. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for all the distractions. Um, I think we're finally starting to go a little crazy here in quarantine, especially my kid. If, he's, if we're just being honest, he's losing it a little bit, okay? But, um, yeah, let me know if you have questions. Let me know if you need anything. And let me just plug one last time. Not one last time. I mean, I did it on our Schoology updates, but let me plug Hannah Zhang. Hannah Zhang is a genius. I go on record saying that. And she is a biology major who is a junior who has a, a group. She still has a tutoring group. And y'all, she made practice exams. I don't know if you ever took advantage of her tutoring when we were still in class. She made practice exams and they were good. <laughs> in fact, I think some of them was the same questions I asked. Some of them were, uh, but just so happened to be that way which was fine with me. So do hit her up. I have an update in Schoology that has the group. You go to my groups, right? Click on that and you can add a group and use that code and you can bring yourself into the biology tutoring group and take advantage of Hannah's expertise in Bio 112 because she did very well in Bio 112. Obviously she's the tutor. And let me know if you have questions, but also feel free to ask her questions because she's a great resource. Okay, I just wanted to know, let you know that that is still available to you. So, all right, I'll see you hopefully Wednesday. Hopefully you're not watching this like a week late. I worry, I really worry. But hopefully I'll see you Wednesday at some point. Or maybe you just want to binge, hey, you should just binge watch these. You could do that, you know. Anyway, so see you Wednesday. We're going to finish talking about some arts and puns, and then we're going to talk about deuterostomes. I was trying to think of a funny way to say deuterostomes that had to do with, never mind. Okay, have a good day.